I'm now really delighted to introduce uh, Dr. Lynn Green, Lynn Green and uh, Louise Sali to uh, uh, come and speak to us. I I'm not going to need to introduce you because you're going to introduce yourselves, which is lovely, but from Cooth, over to you. Thanks, Andy. Um, oh, sorry, that was a bit loud. I'm going to do a really um, quick introduction. Quite frankly, I'm terrified about what vicious technique you're going to use to get me off, and we've got loads of slides to get through, Andy, so... <laughs> I will be keeping my eye on the Please time. be kind. Hi, everyone. Nice to be here. So my name's Lynn. I am a consultant clinical psychologist by uh, background. I've been at Cooth for around about five years now. And I'll tell you a little bit about what, what kind of Cooth does for those of you who don't know. But actually, my background is the NHS. So before Cooth, I spent 20 years working in the NHS in mental health care. My colleague, um, who'll say hello in a sec, and this is Louisa, um, who's the head of research. I'm just going to crack on, I think, with the slides in the interest of time. I feel like I'm stating the obvious um, a bit here, but there is a massive mismatch between need and provision when it comes to mental health care. I don't imagine there is anybody in the room who would disagree with that. We know that... Many mental health disorders start in childhood, 75% by the age of, of 24, and our healthcare systems just do not feel fit for purpose. They just do not feel fit for purpose. The spending is primarily on acute adult mental health care, and of course we do need to spend money there as well, but it feels as though the balance just isn't quite right. And it's not just in the UK, it's right across the globe. I don't have time to go into too much detail here, but I just want to give you an overview of Cooth, where kind of we're landing in terms of our theory of change. Um, some of you might recognise some of these phrases from um, ACT, Acceptance and Commitment Therapy. Just to say we are not an ACT service, we are not a CBT service, we are very much an integrative service, but we see the achievement of psychological flexibility amongst individuals and ultimately communities and populations, one of the real key secrets to success here. And we've been doing this for a long time. So we've been around for ooh, 20, 22 years. So we were founded in 2001. And I guess our ambition throughout the whole sort of, you know, time of being or raison d'etre has been to really work out how we can help to transform healthcare, help to transform healthcare by leveraging digital. It's not about digital over other means, it's about using digital in an integrative way. And there are three broad pillars that we started with, and these are still pillars that we use today. So the first one is about access. So how can we remove some of those barriers that we all know about, I'm not gonna go into them, that prevent people, not just from accessing help, but from seeking help in the, first, in the first instance. The second one is about that upstream support. So we all know that when people get help early and when they get help for a small problem, it stops it from becoming a big problem, and we know that obviously that improves outcomes in the longer term. But it's not just about the upstream. It's about providing support for people at the right time, at whatever place they're at in the pathway, regardless of the severity that they're at. So that's really important to us. And then the last core pillar that I want to mention is around innovation generally, but to do with outcomes specifically. I know from my own experience in the NHS, not just the NHS actually, but that's just where most of my experience is, there's some amazing examples of really good innovative work really good innovations within service. But I think one of the things that we don't do so well, and, you know, sort of including myself in this, we're not always good at finding ways of measuring those outcomes and really demonstrating the impact. So it's something that at Cooth we're really kind of mindful of trying to do. This just gives you an overview of where we're at in the UK. So um, big presence in England, increasingly so in Scotland and Wales really um, big focus on engagement and promotion and, and with a blended model so not just using digital as you would expect us to do but really going out into communities finding out some of the kind of unique differences between communities and really talking with those local partners to find out what we can do 
within Cooth to help and really become part of the local landscape, actually, rather than a kind of add-on to the systems. It would be remiss of me not to mention the US. So um, we launched in the US last year, so in Pennsylvania, um, within a, a schools-based project. And then this year, literally last week, we launched in California. So we've got a four-year um, project in California across the whole of the state. It's a big thing um, for us at Cooth. And one of the things that, part of the reason why I mention it is because one of the things that the California state government liked about, about Cooth, about the model, is our thinking around population approach, which we think is really important. Most of you here, I'm guessing, will have heard of the, um, the I Thrive model from Anna Freud and colleagues, and we're big fans of that as well, by the way. We've developed a model called I Respond, and it really helps us to do that integration piece. I'm not going to go through them all in the interest of time, and I think they're probably quite self-explanatory. But just to pick up on the evidence informed, and I've heard this a little bit today. So within digital, obviously the evidence base is not as broad as it is within face-to-face. -face. It's just not as big, but it is there. And it's vitally important within Cooth that we are always, and within any digital service, that we're working in an evidence-informed way, but also not sitting on our laurels and saying, oh, okay, there's no evidence for that. It's really important that we use our practice-based evidence as well. Um, you know, obviously at, at Cooth, like other um, digital services that I've heard about today, we have years and years of experience and lots of data points. And so we work really hard to try and use those data points to create the evidence to then put back in the system. And you'll hear a little bit more about that today. The other thing that I think is really important to stress here with the evidence informed piece is that, you know, digital isn't for everybody, face to face isn't for everybody. And as part of an evidence-informed framework, it's really important that we also, we know what our strengths are, but we also know what our limitations are as well. And we know when to refer out to other services. And we do this all the time, so we'll refer to NHS specialist services and other services, um, you know, if, if and when that's needed. I would say that we do find that when we do refer out to other services, that most people who are with Cooth tend to stay with Cooth, and it may be that they then work more within the kind of community elements of our service, and I'll say a little bit about that in a sec. Um, or it may be that they work with a, with a counsellor, with a practitioner, around motivation to stay in that service, because we know that dropout rates are really high. Um, and obviously, it's in all of our interests, regardless of where we sit, to keep people in the right service. So just to try and bring it to life a little bit, I'm, I want to talk about an individual, a typical individual who came to us during the pandemic. So Sam is 13. He presented with lots of different symptoms, a little bit jumbled up, lots of losses. So he'd had a bereavement, dad had lost his job. And like many young people, he'd had his own losses in terms of social networks and so on during COVID. Sam heard about Cooth in an assembly, probably um, with one of our engagement team, we called them our feet on the street. And one of the things that really appealed was the fact that he could log into the service easily without having to get permission from parents or involve his parents. And not because he didn't get on with his parents, um, more because he wanted to protect them and didn't want to burden them with his own problems. So just kind of hold Sam in your mind and I'll kind of come back later on and tell you what happened to him. Before I do that, so I, I mentioned the anonymity. Anonymity is pretty central to what we do at Cooth. We don't mandate anonymity, so there are times when it is helpful to have personal details, either for referral purposes or sometimes for safeguarding purposes, not usually, but sometimes. Um, so it is our default model, and time and time again, individuals tell us that this is why they come to Cooth. We also have some partnerships with NHS services whereby we don't have that anonymous front door. So for example, people who are on waiting lists who are perhaps less concerned about the anonymity, um, but quite important. But I think the key thing to say with this slide is that choice is important. We don't offer one thing in terms of therapeutic modality, but equally we don't offer, um, you know, sort of 
just one-to-one -one counselling or just content. We have a wide range of things that we can offer people, and that choice is important because, as we know, what works for one doesn't work for, for everybody else. This just gives you an idea of um, what Cooth might look like on your phone. Um, it's very easy to access. You can access it on any tablet um, or laptop, so I won't dwell on that. I really want to show you this. So I mentioned there are kind of different elements of the site that people can access. So broadly, this slide shows you kind of two um, kind of different sets of activities. The first one, so the one at the bottom, is what we call self-directed. So that's your community, your discussion board, your interaction with peers, content, all of these sorts of things. And then at the top, we've got what we call our professional support. And as you can see, I should say this um, is uh, children and young people. We do have an adult service as well, and it's kind of split. So you can see with our young people, it's broadly 60% in the self-directed versus 40%, and it's the other way around with our adults. One of the things that people often find interesting with this slide is the small number of people, that 5% of users, who are in that structured counselling intervention. It's not too surprising for us because we've seen this pattern over years and this has been kind of built up from our theory of change. If you look at the mode number of sessions for most traditional psychological therapy services, it's actually one. Yet while single sessions is very well established now, um, you know, kind of very well known within the NHS. There's no way of measuring it. So back to that point about innovation around outcomes, there is no way of measuring the effectiveness of a single session. There are experience measures, but there is no way of measuring the effectiveness. So one of the things, you know, back to that practice informed evidence, kind of throwing it into the whole kind of evidence um, domain, we spent three years building a measure. Um, we've had it validated with the Anna Freud Centre, and fingers crossed, we're hoping that next year this will be in the MHS DS for everybody to use, so face-to-face -face as well as digital services because they've been validated in, in both areas, and we've got a separate measure for children and young people. So let me just take you back to Sam, and then I'm going to come back to him at the end as well. So I've described um, very quickly whistle stop tour, the sorts of things that we offer. So what did Sam do? So he, Sam didn't come to the service asking to speak to a therapist, like you know many people don't. He used the online journal and just started writing what he was thinking and feeling in that. It was actually within that journal that his worsening presentation was identified. So we have a team of moderators. Um, the moderation is all um, done by humans. We do have some a um, AI to support that, but the AI doesn't replace the human moderation. So it was through that moderation um, that it was suggested that he might want to um, meet with a counsellor, which he did. And then alongside that counselling, the counsellor recommended that you know, Sam perhaps would benefit from getting involved from some like-minded young people, which he did. He attended forums, um, really kind of started to feel that he wasn't alone. And then it was actually the young people, his peer group, who recommended some activities for him. So that's what he did. I'm going to hand over to Louisa to talk a bit more about the impact in the wider sense, and then we'll come back and think about the outcome for Sam. Great, thank you. So Lynn's really explained there what the service provides and a few of the different aspects to it. And as Lynn was saying that in our iRespond model, we are evidence informed, but we are also evidence generators. So within Cooth, we have a research team and a whole research arm that looks at you know, a variety of research. Today, I'm really gonna be focusing on uh, the impact, so that end of it, but we also do innovation like Lynn was just talking about in terms of our kind of outcome measures. Um, and we have over 17 years worth of peer review uh, publications. So if you're interested in any, come find me after. Okay, so here today I'm going to be talking through a little bit of our, our um, evidence. And this is really looking at how we invest in our evidence generation right from the individual impact to more community-based and then our system and financial impact. So this is really important for us to support decision-making, commissioning. So we think it's really important to be actually being able to tell that full story of how we support that individual, right from improving access um, and outcomes to that wider system impact. And today, that's what I'm going to be focusing on, the, those two ends. 
Okay, so firstly, I'm just going to talk a little bit through um, the access point and, and how we're, over that 21 or 22 years, we've been really pioneering and improving that digital access. Um, so we think it's really important to have some of our features, so that anonymity that, um, that Lynn was talking about, no waiting lists or referrals, again, that's really important. We've got some recent evidence this year uh, from stakeholders and service users that there are really key uh, aspects to reduce burden and reduce barriers to getting support. And this is particularly important to increase access from um, seldom heard groups. Um, this is also very important at the moment. We're really pioneering to support the uh, NHS in initiatives, for example, the Core 20 plus 5. Um, and what we see is that we have a lot of teams on the ground. We don't only rely on our digital uh, marketing and impact, but we really have a lot of engagement teams on the ground working in our community settings and embedding in that local um, community. And what we see is we already see some really great outcomes from this. So, for example, in ethnic minority groups, we see... Typically, they would be underrepresented in um, early, early intervention and prevention services, but we see they make up around 21% of our access across our CYP and our adult services. And that's, you can see, there's an over-indexing compared to 18% of the population in the UK. Again, we see this is very interesting with our gender identities. 5% of our service users identify as non-binary genders compared to 0.5 to 2% of, of uh, the UK population. So that's really important that we are able to provide access to those seldom heard groups. Um, and we see really interesting differences in our in engagement uh, with the platform at that point. It's very important to have that activity uh, and engagement at the front end because you're you're not going to see those wider impacts unless you really have that engagement so we can see here here i'm talking a little bit more about if we have that positive integration what are those longer term ripple out effects that we'd be seeing and those positive effects that we've been uh, theoretically talking about are things like healthcare education government judicial and all of those would be wrapped into those economic cost savings so i'm going to talk you through um, now how we kind of map that evidence so we've taken that from the theory point of point of view and now we're actually looking at how do we um, start building on that early into early uh, evidence modeling so here we're basically saying that we uh, improve access and individual outcomes and that has a positive impact on social and healthcare systems so um, the, the first box here is looking at our presenting issues in Cooth. these aren't all of our presenting issues but this is some of them it's important to note that we're non-diagnostic as a service so these are presenting issues and concerns but they're not diagnostic criteria so we can see here around one in four young people uh, present with suicidal ideation or self-harm, and then around 71% uh, have emotional or behavioural difficulties. So we see the prevalence is quite high, especially for early intervention and prevention service. We do see very high need coming through, probably related to that, the fact that we have no waiting list or no thresholds. So that really kind of lends itself to we will get a lot of uh, uh, a range in severity coming through. The middle column here is talking you through uh, a very brief amount of the outcomes from our LSE evaluation. So LSE conducted a one-month uh, kind of cohort case control, and they were basically uh, found some, some nice outcomes. These are only a few of the outcomes. If you're interested, we can kind of point you in the direction of these. But you can see here that we have a reduction in suicidal ideation, self-harm, and emotional behavioral difficulties over that one-month period. That was only looking at individuals that had the community and the self-help. Um, community and the, the chat-based uh, aspects. So again, that's only one month period, but then uh, we took that through with uh, York Health Economics Consortium, so experts in health economics, and worked with them as well as clinicians and um, commissioners to basically discuss some of the, the longer-term outcomes. And these are things like reduced GP visits, uh, reduced antidepressant prescriptions, uh, reductions in hospitalizations due to self-harm and suicidal ideation, as well as some, some uh, kind of milder uh, effects, for example, reduced crime, reduced binge drinking and smoking, those types of things, as well as positive impacts on educational attainment. One more minute. Yep, that's fine. Um, and here you can see that this is kind of the cost breakdown of that. So what we see here is this is actually um, following a, uh, a typical contract that we have. This is... Um, basically showing the, the cost breakdown of what we would expect to see. So what YHEC did is they looked at our, um, our change points and then mapped that onto what they would expect to see within this population. And this is important to note that this is only our emerging mental health need group. So this is tracking um, 
1,982 children and young people through a one-year period of time. The contract was £140,000, and we can see here the cost breakdown, and there's a cost difference of cost saving of around 300000 there. Um, so you can see that some of the big ticket savings there, so this is cost benefits, so if they invest in us here, they'll save somewhere else. Those big, big ticket savings are GP appointments, antidepressants, as well as kind of follow-up. Some things aren't costed here, which are things like educational attainment. So that's something we are trying to work on. And just as I'll kind of wrap up before I pass back to Lynn, is looking at this, um, what we did found in that, that YHEC economic model is basically saying that digital does really enable a quite scalable and um, cost-effective way to provide um, to provide intervention and prevention, as well as those uh, cost savings to downstream services. For every one pound spent on Cooth, that yields a three pound 16 saving, um, um, yeah, three pound 16 saving to the UK government or NHS system. That equates to around 199 pounds per engaged uh, user that has an emerging mental health need only. Uh, you can see our report here, and you can definitely find us out on the, the booth, but I'll pass back to Lynn to kind of wrap that up in the story of Sam. 30 seconds. <laughs> 30 seconds. Um, yeah, so just wanted to bring it back to the service user. I think if you do that, then, you know, you don't tend to go too far wrong. So just very quickly, um, this gives you an, uh, an idea of where Sam started, where he ended up, and we've tried to map it in terms of the individual, the community, and the more uh, system-based impact. So his core score, just one of the validated measures that we used with Sam, went from medium to mild, and this is over a two-month period, risk rating from amber to green. We don't, by the way, just use a RAG um, system, but it was the easiest way that I could describe it here. He went from having lots of problems all over the place to some very clearly defined goals, all of which were achieved um, within the range that we would expect. And he sort of diminished the, I guess, dependency um, on Cooth. So he went from having weekly sessions to asynchronous. Um, you can see from a content point of view, he just used to read content. He became, uh, you know, a recipient, an active, um, you know, sort of writer of content, helping others, became an ambassador within his school. And, you know, if you look at the last column, he didn't require a costly and lengthy service. And I think, you know, we should all just reflect what might have happened had he not got access to support. I think we've all, I've worked in um, inpatient CAMs and the number of times I've thought, I wish this person had come to services two, three, four years earlier. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> come and see us, come and see us in the foyer if you've got time. <laughs>